Tonight, with Thanksgiving a week away, America is on the brink of opening up booster shots to all. But why did it take so long as cases of COVID start to rise again? Tonight, I talk with the one and only Dr. Anthony Fauci. Plus, a court hears from Travis McMichael, accused of shooting and killing Ahmed Arbery. Like Carl Rittenhouse, he's claiming self-defense, but will it hold up in court? And later, the rise of authoritarianism at home and abroad. Political scientist Brian Class has been sounding the alarm for a while now. He He's here to talk about his important new book. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. One week from today, millions of Americans will defy the laws of geometry and somehow squeeze 25 people at their eight-person dining tables. They'll huddle up for extra clothes for photos in the living room with the extended fam. They'll hug grandma and grandpa at the doorway as the scent of turkey and thyme wafts out from the kitchen. Last year, such a scene was unthinkable for so many of us. But this is our second Thanksgiving of the pandemic era. And this year, we will all cram in together, despite the fact that this week, and only this week, the CDC is finally getting around to authorizing booster shots for all adults. For those of you who are always late to show up for dinner, Perhaps you'll get the irony of the fact that evidence has mounted for months backing the need for vaccine boosters. More and more vaccinated Americans are ending up in the hospital. Here's what the last two weeks look like in this country. Cases rapidly climbing, 23,000 in a day. And while the Delta wave has crested, we are still experiencing 9-11 death tolls every three days. Since Monday, 3,384 people have died in this country from the coronavirus. Globally, more than 5 million people around the world have confirmed to have died, have been confirmed to have died from COVID-19. Although The Economist magazine, along with some prominent global health experts, suspects the real number of coronavirus deaths could be close to 17 million because of vast undercounting. A disease which I'll remind you was first detected exactly two years ago this week, two years ago this week in the Hubei province of China. It's been two years and we're still talking about whether it's safe to travel and then sit around a table, maskless, with mum and dad on Thanksgiving. Safe or not, AAA predicts that some 53 million Americans will travel next week, bringing us nearly back to pre-pandemic levels for the most intense travel day of the year. And yet, the holiday comes at a time when Americans first vaccinated last winter have waning immunity. Children under 12 are just getting the jab. Boosters aren't quite there for the average adult. And, oh yeah... There are governors like the guy in Florida who are going out of their way to suck the air out of any vaccination momentum. Ron DeSantis put his signature on a package of bills today which punish businesses that mandate vaccines, completely counter to President Biden's federal mandate. But in case you're wondering if DeSantis cares about that clash, a common theme ran through the event in Brandon, Florida. That's where he did it. That's where he chose to sign. An incredible personal honor to be here today in my home county, yeah. right here in Brandon, Florida, that has... <laughs> the chance of let's go, Brandon, now a familiar euphemism for bleep President Biden. So, yeah, DeSantis doesn't give a hoot about bucking federal guidance on vaccine mandates that keep everyone safer. Think about that as you mash the Idaho potatoes this year and jam some more folding chairs into the dining room. Will you feel safe? Should you? Earlier tonight, I spoke with the chief medical advisor to the president and the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, thanks for coming back on the show. It's been a long, winding road to get to this week when boosters for all adults are coming. In September, a CDC advisory panel said no to boosters for people in high-risk jobs. Dr. Walensky, head of the CDC, probably ignored that advice and approved that group. In October, Moderna and J&J &J boosters were greenlit, and you recommended people stick to the brand they started with. A week later, Dr. Walensky said it's personal preference. Mix and match is fine. Once again, the critics are saying it's mixed messaging from the administration on COVID, on vaccines, on public health. What do you say in response? Well, it's taken out of context completely, Mady, for the simple reason that we did, I, my group, did the mix and match study. So when I was asked the question, 
what happens if I get J&J? &J? Should I get J&J &J again? And I said, fine, if you'd like to stick with your own one, but if one reason or other you can't, that's the reason why we did the mix and match study. So I think it's another example of things just taken out of context. There was no, there was no okay. ambiguity. We want, we want people to get boosted. It's very important. Whether you get the original shot or you mix and match, just get boosted. It's very important but to get boosted. But Dr. Walensky clearly wanted to press for more boosters for more people earlier. Here we are yeah. one week before millions of Americans travel to Thanksgiving gatherings, and the government in this country is just now clearing all adults for boosters. In hindsight, we should have done this earlier, shouldn't we? This is not great timing. Well, uh, Mighty, I've been saying let's do it earlier for a quite a long time, and you need to understand the process. When I and my colleagues were pushing to get it done for everybody earlier, the committees, the outside advisory committees, yeah. were saying we've got to be careful because of safety. So if we had done it then, you would have a committee member up here saying we rushed it. So now that we're finally getting it done, you're saying, why didn't we do it sooner? <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's get real here. <laughs> I guess people are looking at the timelines of these things and wondering <laughs> it would have been easier if we weren't doing it on the eve of Thanksgiving. You but know, I take your point. Uh, New, New York Governor Kathy Hochul said yesterday, Dr. Fauci, people should wear masks indoors and maintain six feet of distancing, adding, quote, we all want to celebrate Thanksgiving safely. This is how we do it. Is that how you're going to do it? Are you planning to stay no. masked at Thanksgiving dinner? Again, what we need, Mady, is clarity of message. I am vaccinated. Yes. My wife is vaccinated. My next door neighbors are vaccinated. We are gonna come over my house. We're gonna have a classical, typical, like warm family dinner, no masks, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. When Christmas comes, my children are vaccinated. My wife and I are vaccinated. They're all gonna come from different parts of the country, and we're gonna have a fine time at home the way all families should have. And that's the reason why we keep saying you dramatically decrease your risk if you get vaccinated. So you won't be worrying about breakthrough cases because we're hearing so much about breakthroughs these days. You know, breakthrough cases occur, Mady, when someone comes into contact with an infected person. And the major reservoir of infected people are those who are unvaccinated. And that's one of the reasons why we say even though some people feel, I don't want to get vaccinated because it's my choice. When you think about it, yes, it certainly is your choice. Yes. But if you do get vaccinated, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting family, but you're also implementing what I call your societal responsibility to not allow this virus to just run rampant throughout society and we have 62 million people in the country who are eligible to be vaccinated who have not gotten vaccinated. That's the source Crazy. of the 85,000 infections that we're having every day. Indeed. The data coming out now that's driving the booster discussion among the vaccinated is all to do with waning immunity. So if that's the case, that immunity is waning, why not boosters for under 18 too? I have a teenager, Dr. Fauci, who got her second shot six months ago. When does she get a booster? Well, the situation is whenever you make a decision, you want to make it based on scientific data. It's dangerous yes. not to. And right now we are looking exactly at what you're saying. How long does the protection last in a younger person? I can tell you from my 45 year experience as an immunologist, it probably lasts significantly longer than an elderly person like myself. So if your children or your people that you know who are younger and have gotten vaccinated with their healthy immune system, it is likely that they will, they will wane in their immunity much less rapidly than an elderly person. And when they do, I can assure you, we'll be ready to give them a boost. That is good to hear. Dr. Fauci, earlier today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a series of bills uh, into law that cracked down on businesses requiring employees to be vaccinated for COVID-19. And he said this, have a listen. OSHA is putting out this rule 
uh, they're going to say that whatever you need to do, but they're going to move the goalposts and they're going to say, if you don't have a booster by a certain date, then you're unvaccinated, you could lose your job. People tried to say, oh, you know, that's not what they said. Well, now even Fauci is saying he wants the boosters to count. New Mexico said, unless you do the boosters, they're going to consider you unvaccinated. So uh, we, we reject that approach. That approach would upend. <laughs> That would upend a lot of people's jobs. Dr. Fauci, what is your response to Governor DeSantis, who, of course, has presided over thousands of COVID deaths this year in Florida? Well, I think he's making a mistake, and, 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 and the information he's giving is not correct because fully vaccinated means two doses of an mRNA or one dose of J&J. &J. That's fully vaccinated. Booster is not a requirement right now for fully vaccinated. We want to vaccinate people to protect them. Vaccinations work. If you encourage people not to get vaccinated, you are essentially telling them to put themselves at risk, at danger for themselves and for their family. So I really am not sure what he's talking about. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you saw, you heard them. They were applauding um, when he was making his remarks about you. You're not that popular in Republican circles, I think it's fair to say. Uh, they have, uh, many of them have demonized you, including Ron DeSantis. We just heard from him. We've seen Senator Rand Paul go after you uh, when you testify in front of the Senate. He blames you for COVID, uh, which is right. ludicrous. So I want to put bad faith Republicans to one side for a moment. And I want to focus, though, on what The Intercept did, as you no, they obtained documents late this summer, which NBC News has not verified or seen, I should add, but which seem to suggest that the NIH and your part of it did fund gain of function research in Wuhan, basically making viruses more dangerous or contagious in order to study them. In May, you testified that the NIH has never done gain of function research in Wuhan. The documents don't establish whether you knew about that work or that funding. So I do wonder what's your response to this intercept reporting and these documents? Well, the intercept reporting is completely misleading because gain of function, matey, is a completely meaningless term unless you put it into context. And what has happened is that years ago, we paused all function on manipulating viruses, which is an absolutely essential part of virology, in order to get certain guard rules and guidelines about what constitutes research that in fact might be dangerous and need special oversight. That took three years of deliberation to set guardrails and guidelines and to get rid of the ambiguous and misleading term of gain of function so that you could proceed with experiments if they fall within those guidelines. The NIH funded studies, which were highly, highly peer reviewed and felt to be very important to understand but, what the risk is. Now, let me finish, because no one ever lets me finish, and then they go on and talk about what gain of function is. The fact is, that was done under very strict guidelines. Then all of a sudden, somebody comes in and says, I don't like your guidelines, even though it took three years from the National Academy of Sciences, the NSABB, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the White House, to come up with these strict guardrails, which were followed very carefully. Then someone comes along and says, you know, I don't like that definition. And according to my definition, you did, quote, gain of function again. So the meaningless term of gain of function, it doesn't mean anything. I, un I understand. Yeah. I understand. I'm not going to get into an argument with you about what gain of function is. I have a degree in politics. I'm not going to argue yeah. with you about that. What I'm going to say is, as you pointed out, a lot of people have different definitions. The Intercept interviewed Vincent Rassiniello, I probably butchered his name, professor of microbiology and immunology at Columbia. He says it is gain of function. Tony Fauci is wrong saying it's not. Many others say you're wrong about that. And I'm not, I don't want to get into an argument about who's right or wrong about the definition. What I do want to well, ask you is, do you not think these documents make you think twice about any of the funding or research that was done, that this is kind of dangerous stuff, potentially dangerous. Does it not raise any questions about oversight or funding? Whatever you want yeah. to call it, gain of function, whatever name we give to it. If you're going to give me some seconds to answer you, I'll be happy to. And it's like this. Yeah. I am, my, my, the NIH is totally open that if people have a problem 
with the guardrails that were put into place by three years of a deliberative process in good faith by people ranging from all areas, including the National Academy of Sciences, I'm fine with re-looking at it. Now, Vince Ricaniello is a very good virologist and, and, and you know, a, a person I totally respect. If they feel that those guardrails should be changed, then let's change them. But what we're seeing now is that after three years, and I'll give you a metaphor that's really important, matey, that the speed limit is 50 miles an hour and we're going 40 miles an hour. Then all of a sudden somebody comes and says, I think that the speed limit should be 30 miles an hour and you're going 40, so you're wrong, you're breaking the speed limit. And I say, wait a minute, if you want the speed limit to be 30 miles an hour, I will go 29 miles an hour. But when the speed limit is 50 miles an hour and I'm going okay. 40 miles an I hour, don't tell me I'm breaking the speed limit. Yes, you I got get it. it. You're talking about the rules move. But I do understand that point. But just one last quick thing, because we're out of time. You don't think there's an issue about dangerousness with anything that was funded by your department I, on your watch? I, I'm, I, I, if you look at the experiments and the design of the experiments, they were done for the purpose of surveillance of what is out in the community already got it. there. If you don't like that, Change the rule, and we will abide by the rule. Dr. Fauci, it's a complicated subject. I appreciate you unpacking it for us. Important questions. Appreciate you taking time out tonight. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. The never-ending wait for the Build Back Better bill is getting closer to ending as the House gets closer to passing it, maybe tonight. At the moment, things are on track for it to clear the House tonight. The Build Back Better rule passed the committee 9-3 to three on a party-line vote. Right now, the House is voting on some procedural rules. Then they'll get down to the actual vote. It could pass by perhaps 10 or 11 o'clock Eastern tonight. After weeks of drama, today's delay was due to a few last-minute snags that included the cost analysis from the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO has just released its projection on the bill earlier today. It predicts Democrats... It predicts this BBB, the Democrat Social Spending Package, will cost $1.7 trillion over a decade and add $367 billion to the deficit. But that number drops to just $160 billion over 10 years, remember, when you add in how much the CBO estimates an IRS tax crackdown on high earners could bring in. Will this be enough to get the handful of conservative Democrats who have objected to this bill on board? Let's see. But never forget this. Republicans passed nearly $2 trillion in unfunded Trump tax cuts in 2017. They didn't care about CBO scores or deficits or adding to the debt. And their tax cuts help the rich. Build Back Better cuts child poverty and takes some baby steps towards saving our damn planet. Still ahead, if we've learned anything in the last couple of weeks, it's that the definition of what qualifies as self-defense in the American justice system is up to a lot of interpretation. But today in the trial of the men accused of killing Ahmed Arbery, did one of those claims just fall apart under cross-examination? I'll explain in 60 seconds. Don't go away. Over the past two weeks, it has seemed at times that the thing that's really on trial is the justice system itself. Just eight days after we heard Carl Rittenhouse testify in a Kenosha, Wisconsin courtroom, that he fired on protesters with a semi-automatic rifle, killing two of them in what he said was self-defense. The man who fired the bullet that killed Ahmed Arbery, Travis McMichael, took the stand in Brunswick, Georgia. McMichael, as you may recall, shot Arbery, an unarmed black man, as Arbery was out jogging in February of 2020. Two other white men, McMichael's father and a neighbor, are also charged in Arbery's death. But only Travis has appeared on the stand. During his testimony yesterday, McMichael, like Rittenhouse, claimed that he had shot Aubrey in self-defense. So you got out of your truck and you yelled at him. Stop. As he was coming, as he's getting close to me, yes, I was, I was yelling, at, yelling at him at that point to stop, yes, ma'am. And he turned around to run back. He did. Didn't threaten you in any way? No. Didn't verbally threaten you? Not like verbally. yell at you? Not verbally, no. Didn't swear at you? Didn't swear. Didn't say anything? Did not. Didn't pull out a gun? He did not pull out a gun. 
turned around and ran away. Once he got from me to you, directed to me, mm -hmm. uh, once I reached into my, my truck is when he turned and ran away. Yes, ma'am. So that was Michael speaking today, McMichael speaking today. Yesterday he had said he fired in self-defense. Today he seemed to contradict himself, as you heard there, kind of wilting under withering cross-examination uh, and telling prosecutors this morning that Arbery never really threatened him. Prosecutors also reminded McMichael that he was the one pursuing Arbery and that Arbery continuously tried to run away. Let's play that clip. And it, the evidence itself would require one to make that logical leap that the court's concerned about with others. Having some issues with our clips there. Um, that was the judge speaking. Um, so that was the trial today when McMichael was on the stand. McMichael talked about self-defense yesterday. We played the clip where the prosecutor put him under pressure about whether he was actually using self-defense, it's a major case. And we are on the precipice of two major cases coming through right now. The Rittenhouse trial in Wisconsin and this trial in Brunswick, Georgia. Two trials that will tell us a great deal about where we stand in America right now when it comes to justice and race and policing in this country. Two major verdicts coming up. Joining me now, former president of the National Bar Association, C.K. Hoffler, and civil rights attorney Charles Coleman. Thank you both for joining me this evening. CK, let me start with you. The defense gambled by having Travis McMichael testify, and we just played a clip from today where he was very much on the defensive. Seemed like proof that the gamble didn't pay off. Is there any way the defense can recover from this? You know, Maddie, I don't think so. I think it was a terrible gang, gam gamble for them to take. Um, it's always very strategic when the defense in a criminal trial makes the determination to put the defendant on the stand. It's strategic. They must have thought that he was going to testify in a way that was very compelling. And he did a decent job, but there were so many holes and inconsistencies within his testimony on direct that all the prosecutor did, she started yesterday, but today was simply annihilate him in a very methodical way on um, some very common sense things demonstrated that this notion of self-defense you were the aggressor you were pursuing a mod aubrey he was not he was in a position of trying to retreat and you chased him down and that was something that he had to admit and he also had to admit that Ahmaud aubrey's demeanor did not speak of anyone who was threatening as he had indicated in his direct examination. She also caught him in a bunch of inconsistencies slash lies. You see, so when you gamble and put a defendant on the stand during a criminal case, you better gam gamble and know exactly what he's going to say because evidently they miss part of the preparation because he completely withered on cross-examination, yeah. especially today. So Charles, let me bring you in there. As a former prosecutor, what was your reaction to today's cross-examination? Well, Mehdi, I'm reminded of a very famous quote by Mike Tyson, where he said, everyone <laughs> has a plan until they get hit. And today, the nice. defendant got hit. The prosecution definitely let it go and let it fly when they did their cross-examination of Mr. McMichael. Now, yesterday, what we saw during the direct of Mr. McMichael was a very different tone, which was appropriate, and that was going extremely well for the defense. What they did at that point, in his conversational manner, he was able to disarm the jury in a way that if you weren't paying close attention, you wouldn't even have realized that he was on trial for the murder of someone. And the, and the, defen the, the defense attorney did a very skillful job of asking questions to his client to elicit answers that made his responses seem very, very rational and the responses of Ahmaud Arbery to seem very, very irrational until yesterday and today when the prosecutor began to pick that apart. Because what she did very, very artfully was she actually changed that tone and she made it very clear to the jury that it was, in fact, the actions of Mr. McMichael that were the ones that were irrational. And that when you lay this out all together, now that the defense has actually rested its case, during summation, they are going to drive this home that it was Mr. McMichael's actions that were irrational, and he should not get the benefit of being able to plead self-defense. 
CK, the trial of Arbery's killing is being heard by a nearly all-white jury, as is the Rittenhouse trial. How does this keep happening in 2021? And is there any concrete action that can be, that can be taken to diversify these juries? Well, it really is a travesty when you look at the demographics in particular of the community in Georgia. Um, there's just really, it, it's not explicable. And even the judge, as we know, said that he felt there was intentional discrimination, yet he let the trial go forward with this jury. I think what's important is people must show up for jury duty. They must vote. We have to push that. And the reason for this, that's how you cure some of this. Make sure you know who you're electing when you're electing the clerk of court. Make sure you know the judges that you're electing. Watch the judges. Certainly, if I'm in Kenosha and I'm seeing the judge in Kenosha rule the way he's ruling and act the way he's acting with what I believe is inappropriate judicial temperament, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to make sure I vote. I'm going to make sure I try to do something about that. That's part of how we cure this. But if people don't show up for jury duty, then it's very difficult to complain about what happens at a jury trial. Now. In addition to that, you have to watch who you're appointing as or electing as prosecutors, as the clerk of court, as judges. All of those people are elected officials in most jurisdictions. So this is a good example. Look and see who your elected officials are and how they are acting in very important trials that basically touch on most of the civil rights, human rights, voting rights issues, and race issues in this country. So that's how I see it, yes. Minnie. Charles, the defense attorneys in both cases have made multiple requests for mistrial. Is it unusual to have so many calls for a mistrial? And do you think these requests are being made in good faith? You know, it is unusual to see this many requests for a mistrial and this many motions for a mistrial. Uh, I am not surprised that the judges have, in each of the respective cases, denied these requests. Um, I do think to, to have one during the course of a trial is not necessarily unheard of. Uh, at this point, you have to question if it is in good faith, because all you really need is one on a particular issue for the purposes of preserving the record for an appeal. And you can understand that, and, and, and viewers should understand that that is oftentimes why that is requested. It's requested so that you have preserved your record. If your client is convicted, then ultimately you may be able to appeal that issue and then get them free if you're able to get that conviction overturned. But at this point, the multiple requests are just senseless. And quite frankly, I don't know whether they are in good faith and one could so soundly argue that they are not. CK, Charles Blow wrote yesterday in the New York Times that as white males, McMichael and Rittenhouse were given passes others don't get, able to scoff at the rules without thinking that they would face any repercussions. With the eyes of the country on these trials, do you think we're getting any closer to holding violent white men accountable? I hate to be the voice of pessimism. I don't think we're getting closer. I think we're just touching the surface. Every day we make more progress, but there's so much work that we have to do to level the playing field. So much more work. If we just look at the demeanor in the courtroom and the Cal Rittenhouse case, who's ever heard of having a defendant who is being accused of murdering two people and injuring another and endangering other people able to choose who the alternates are going to be in a random lottery so close to the, 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 the court officers, just like we're in a kumbaya fest, all of us loving each other together. This is a double murder trial. What are we talking about? So, no, we have a lot of work to do. If you imagine for a moment if that were a young black man, first of all, he probably would have come out in a orange um, in his orange suit because he would have been coming from the jail cell. He probably would not have had one of the best um, jury consultants in the country. He would not have had this dream team of defense lawyers, all of that. So I think we have a long ways to go to level the playing field, but there is I mean, an incremental amount of progress. He, he probably wouldn't be on trial if it was a young black man. He'd probably be dead and he would have been shot on the scene in Kenosha and not be able to go home to his bed and sleep at night and get, you know, just, the whole thing's absurd. Uh, Charles, last word to you. If sure, one you, man, or all of these yeah. men get off, if they, if they all get away with it, okay, if they're all found not guilty, we should point out, they're innocent until proven guilty. If they're all found not guilty, what do you think the reaction will be in America at large, and especially, I have to say, in black America? I think this will be definitely problematic, not only through America, but also, uh, especially within black America. CK and I have been having this conversation for the past two weeks, so I know exactly what she's going to say, and she knows what I'm going to say. I will remind viewers that 
1857, the Supreme Court of the United States of America issued a decision in a case very well known, that is Dred Scott versus Sanford. And in that case, the Supreme Court stated that the black man has no rules and no laws upon which and no rights that the white man is bound to, re to respect. If we look at what is going on in this Arbery case, the whispers of the Dred Scott decision are all over it. Everything from the boldness and entitlement of what it was for these three white men to feel like they could hunt down Ahmaud Arbery, corner him when he was outnumbered and outgunned, and decide that they wanted to use their weapons on him, to what we have seen in the courtrooms in 2021, where a white attorney has said, no more black pastors should be allowed in here. You yeah. got a chance to select the jury. You don't get a chance to select the audience. But that sense of entitlement that comes directly from that decision, that Dred Scott decision is still very much alive. And I think it will awaken the fury of a number of people should these people get acquitted. Well. Charles, don't worry. If uh, some conservatives get their way, no one will even be taught about Dred Scott in school, so we won't even need to talk about it anymore. Anyways, on that note, I will uh, thank you both. Charles CK, appreciate your analysis as ever. Still ahead, for weeks, no months, the silence of Republican House leader Kevin McCarthy was deafening as members of his caucus threatened violence against Democratic colleagues. Truly awful, until McCarthy did speak yesterday and we found out he shrugged off such behavior. It was just a joke, he said. A new book, Corruptible, explores the erosion of norms and guardrails that leads to the rise of awful authoritarians, both here and abroad. Author Brian Klaas joins me next in 60 seconds. When I'm down here in Mar-a-Lago, and I'm going to be interviewing our real president, Donald J. Trump. Mail-in ballots are a disaster. They basically use COVID-19 or the China virus mm -hmm. to rig the election. And it was very sad when Mike Pence yeah. gave those votes over because when you have more votes than you have voters, when you have other things that are so wrong... That's former President Donald Trump decked out in a tuxedo spouting his usual election lies to the pillow guy, Mike Lindell, for an extended interview that was posted to Lindell's social media. A dressy and dishonest airing of grievances. My goodness, is it Festivus again already? It's easy to laugh at these people, and we should. They're ridiculous. But the threat to our civil society is dead serious. Trump is the de facto leader of the Republican Party. He's their top candidate for president in 2024. And Mike Lindell still speaks to packed crowds and sells lots of pillows, somehow. Ten months after the insurrection and hang Mike Pence, these self-absorbed men and their lies still abound. And so does the danger. We saw evidence of that yesterday in the House where 207 out of 209 Republicans would not censure Arizona GOP Congressman Paul Gosar for tweeting out an animated video depicting him killing Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and attacking the president, Joe Biden, with a sword. It was a joke, he said. He deleted it, even though he meant no harm. And yet, moments after the vote to censure, Gosar reposted the video that had caused it all, the video depicting him murdering a congressional colleague. Why is it that people in positions of power so often seem to be the worst people you could give power to? It's not just a problem here in the US. From Hungary to India to Belarus to the Philippines and beyond, much of the world is increasingly under the thrall of charismatic and capricious authoritarians. Those of you who watch this show regularly know I'm obsessed with this issue of autocracy and of Republican Party neo-fascism. One of the people who's made a career out of thinking about these trends is Brian Klaas. The Oxford-trained political scientist is an expert on democracy and authoritarianism. His field research includes interviews with presidents, rebels, coup plotters, and dissidents around the world, from America to Zambia. And he brings it all together in a new book, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us. In it, Klaas uses new and old psychological and political research as well as case studies of shipwrecked teenagers, tyrannical homeowners associations and renegade school maintenance workers to plumb the nature of human leadership and corruption. It's not just about our political leaders, it's about our bosses, our PTA presidents and our own evolutionary programming. The book asks, do worse people get power? Does power make people worse? And how can we ensure that incorruptible people get into power and wield it justly? Nothing heavy, right? Provocatively, Klaas says there are reasons, both genetic and cultural, for why and how we choose those who lead us. And he says we have critical lessons to learn if we want better institutions and fewer kleptocrats and authoritarians in control of our day-to-day -day lives. 
Earlier, I spoke to him about his new book. Brian, your new book opens with a question. Does power corrupt or are corrupt people drawn to power? For our viewers who haven't read your book yet, can you give us a sense of your answer to that question? Yeah, so the answer is, is both. Um, what I did in this book is I looked at uh, how dictators' personalities, the things that I've studied of despots and authoritarian rulers around the world, trickle down into our communities, into our businesses, and whether there is a trend in which corruptible people are more drawn to power. The answer is that power does corrupt, but actually that's one of the least interesting and one of the smallest aspects of how power affects people. What I think is one of the big takeaways from the book is that the wrong kind of people are drawn to power like moths to a flame, and that you can either counteract that with good systems or you can encourage that with bad systems. And I think one of the problems in modern society is that we have too many systems that amplify that tendency of human nature to draw the worst people into positions yes. of authority. And I have to ask you this, Brian, the new book is called Corruptible. It's about why we so often seem to have these worst people in positions of authority. It's 320 pages long, and there is not a single mention of the name Trump in this book. That seems tough to pull off. Was that a conscious choice on your part? It was a conscious choice because I think, you know, we live in a super divided society right now. And I think one of the things that I wanted to achieve with this book is to say that regardless of political divides, most Americans actually agree that the people in charge are not our best that in fact we have a lot of dysfunctional people in charge. You know, whenever I talk to people, they say, why is it that all the people I know, you know, my friends and family members are good and decent? And when I look at the person who's in charge of, you know, my congressional district or my homeowners association or my boss's boss, they're awful or abusive. And I think the lessons are universal in this book. So what I tried to do was to avoid some of the more hot button issues that divide us. and present universal aspects of how power functions so that even people who disagree strongly with me about Donald Trump might take away some lessons and implement them in a way that will build better leaders for the United States and beyond. I wish you good luck in that particular endeavor. <laughs> let me ask you one Trump-related question. Uh, you talk about the dark triad in your book, this trifecta of Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy that the worst leaders exhibit. And of course, my mind again goes to Trump. Uh, but I want to ask you about the comical absurdity of some of these strongmen, including Trump. We're used to thinking of dictators, demagogues, as having only a dark streak, like Hitler, or even a Putin or Orban today, very serious, very Dower. Trump is so comedic that even when he's saying very dangerous things, a lot of us, myself included, are tweeting, well, he's wearing a tux, talking to a guy who sells pillows. This is hilarious. But it's also dangerous. And I wonder, what do you think about those biases we have that favor such people, that favor such authoritarians, even if they are comical authoritarians? It's a great point that you're making, because I think one of the things I try to do in the book is to turn the mirror back on society and say, OK, we all know that our leaders are often awful. So why do we pick them? Why do we allow them to lead us? And that has more to do with us than it does with them. And I think the comedy is part of that. It takes the edge off, right? So nobody wants to follow a strong man who appears to be a strong man in modern America. I mean, the idea of being a devotee of Trump, the authoritarian, is not as Trump the amusing authoritarian, right? And so I think he uses yeah. that to great effect to try to keep, as you say, take the edge off of him. But it's just as dangerous. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting is that term strongman is no accident. One of the studies that I explore in the book looks at how during times of crisis, real or imagined, we gravitate towards yeah. leaders who tend to be overconfident, yes. large men. And this is embedded in Stone Age biases that we have that linger over from literally hundreds of thousands of years ago where there might have been an evolutionary advantage based on size. And so, you know, this is why Vladimir Putin takes his shirt off. It's why Trump says American carnage and I alone can fix it. And for a subset yeah. of our population, those messages are extremely seductive. So I think one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this book was why yeah. is it that we are seduced? And the only way to counteract Act that seduction is to acknowledge that it exists in some of us so that we can start to think more rationally about the leaders that we pick. It's, 
It's such a good point about the ancient biases. Although I would add, to be fair to Trump, he is smart enough not to take his top off a la Vladimir Putin. I'm not sure that would work in his favor. Brian, when you look at what happened in Congress this week, Paul Gosar, Republican congressman, tweets this ghastly, I don't know, snuff video out. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy defends him. And immediately after the censure vote, in, all, in which every Republican bar Kinzinger and Cheney votes with Gosar, Gosar goes out and retweets the offending video again. Is there any hope at this point of stopping the Republican Party in America from becoming a full-on 24-7 authoritarian neo-fascist political grouping? Or are we too far gone? I'm really pessimistic in the short to medium term. I think that there are very few avenues that could counteract the trends that are happening in the Republican Party right now. But what I'm really worried about that we're not talking enough about, I think, and that you know echoes a lot of the themes in the book, is what happens when people like Gosar are the people that we see in positions of power? What happens when they get a slap on the wrist or they get away with it altogether? And the answer is that when people are looking at the idea of going into politics, you know, power hungry people are going to go for it no matter what. They want to. They, the, the worst of our society is drawn to power for power's sake. The best of our society weighs up the costs and benefits. And when they see somebody like Gosar tweeting out a video depicting murder of one of the colleagues in Congress and really, you know, being given a free pass by his colleagues, that's going to deter good and decent people from running from office. The same is true, by the way, with all those yes, videos yes. of school board members who are facing death threats for promoting public health advice. I mean, if you want to help your kid's school district and you have to think, well, you know, I don't really want to spend all this much time and I don't really care about the power. I just want to help. But on the negative side, you're going to get harassed and possibly face death threats. I mean, you're just going to bow out. So I'm, what I'm really worried about is the Republican Party is going over the brink, not just where it's beyond rescue in terms of authoritarianism, but actually in terms of how it's socializing the political culture for the next generation. Because as bad as these people are, the people yeah. who look up to Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene are very likely to be worse in the future. And that's something that's profoundly, profoundly depressing, but it's something we need to grapple with. It's a very good point, but as you say, it's also a very depressing point. The book is Corruptible. Brian Klaas, thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Up next, if it wasn't facing enough challenges already, Afghanistan is now on the brink of famine, with 23 million people facing crisis levels of hunger. We'll discuss why in 60 seconds with a very special guest. Stay with us. The end of a war never means the end of a crisis, and that's especially true in Afghanistan. It's been just over three months since the Taliban took back the country, and now, according to the UN this week, its people are on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. Around 60% of the country's 38 million people are facing crisis levels of hunger in a food emergency that will likely worsen as temperatures drop over the winter. More than 3 million children under the age of five could face malnutrition by the end of the year. NBC's Richard Engel documented some of the heartbreaking scenes in Afghanistan's hospitals where children have literally been starving to death. A nurse at a clinic in Herat, run by Doctors Without Borders, measures Farzana's arm. If the band goes red, she's severely malnourished. Farzana is nearly at the end of the scale, weighing six and a half pounds at eight months old. As U.S. troops pulled out, the Taliban took over and aid money stopped. Now, the people are starving. Occupancy here is up 70% compared to last year. Ali Umar's mother was herself malnourished, so the baby was born too weak to suckle. Things have gotten worse since the Taliban came. What little we had went to zero. So what's behind this sudden and severe hunger crisis? The main cause is U.S. and European sanctions. The U.N. Special Envoy to Afghanistan said sanctions have paralyzed the banking system, affecting every aspect of the economy, and that this preventable problem will only help facilitate terrorism, trafficking, and further drug smuggling. See, the U.S. and its allies don't consider the Taliban the legitimate leaders of the country. That's why they've imposed a series of sanctions on the so-called Islamic Emirate and have frozen nearly all its overseas assets when the government fell. Back in August, the U.S. froze more than $9 billion in reserves belonging to the Afghan Central Bank. Since then, the Taliban has been urging the U.S. and European allies to give it back. A spokesman for the finance ministry has said they will respect human rights, including the education of women. 
it's no doubt hard to trust the Taliban. But for as long as this back and forth about who has a right to the money to run Afghanistan, as long as that continues, it's millions of everyday Afghans who will be facing the consequences of an economic collapse. Joining me now to discuss this is Pashtana Durrani, a prominent social and political rights activist from Afghanistan. She's currently in DC. She's the founder and executive director of Learn Afghanistan, which focuses on teaching girls and young women. And it's continued operating since the Taliban's takeover. I hope she can tell us more about that. Pashtana, thanks so much for joining us on the show this evening. Uh, you made it to the US just a week ago, uh, but after the Taliban took power in August, it looked like you were going to stay back. You had moved your school underground. You were doing a lot of interviews from there. What changed your mind? What made you decide to leave Afghanistan? Thank you for having me, Mahdi. Um, the first thing that when the Taliban decided to take over, the, the one thing that they did was shut down every school, shut down our university, and shut down all the offices that local organization left. And for me, maybe, because they are doing it for the first two months or the one month, but they never agreed on it. Right now, a white woman in Afghanistan can walk around, can uh, take pictures with them, while uh, Afghan women have to stay back and stay at home, not go to school, not go teach, not go to work. And uh, that's something that we need. And one thing I remember from uh, a professor who told me, he was like, you know that you can do a lot of work when you are in Afghanistan, but you can do much more when you are out of Afghanistan, because right now people need you to get out to, uh, to stay alive, but also at the same time, make sure that people understand the humanitarian crisis are high level and people need someone to uh, talk about it in the Western world. Last month, you tweeted images from the launch of one of your organization's new schools, a STEM and art school for girls aged 13 to 18. You enrolled 100 girls. What was that like, especially under Taliban control? Has that school had to stay underground? Because we know there have been reports of some girls' schools being allowed to operate, but many have been also closed. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's heartbreaking when you have to tell all your 7,000 students that only 100 of you will be taught because all 7,000 of you won't be able to come in the same place. So we have to start only with 100. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have been able to expand and we'll be expanding actually to two more schools and uh, starting this December. But at the same time, it breaks your heart that all these bright girls that you promised a bet better future are now at home. Yesterday, the UN Special Representative to Afghanistan spoke to the press. She was asked how the Taliban was responding to concerns related to protecting ethnic and religious minorities, including restoring women's rights. And she actually sounded hopeful. Have a listen. The more exposure that the Taliban de facto authority has to these concerns of the international community, the more they understand them, the more consultation and collaboration we have. We are seeing small progress and that makes me feel like we can get more. We've read reports, Pashtana, of Shia Muslim minority communities, quote, cautiously embracing the Taliban, even patrolling with them in areas that Shia families were once massacred by the Taliban. And as we just discussed, some girls' schools have been allowed to open. So is this a Taliban 2.0? Is this a newer, more moderate, cuddlier Taliban? Or is that unrealistic to think that they can change in that way? Well, first of all, every time you see a school that's opening, it's just because there is a bigger problem going on in Afghanistan and they want you to forget that and cover the same schools that are open. Afghanistan is a ruler country. How many schools have opened up in a ruler Afghanistan? How many schools are functioning right now? We never know this. We see a few pictures of girls being in school in one of the region and we feel, OK, yeah, maybe something is progressing there. No, it's not. It's fake. First of all, even if it's opened, how many days is it functioning? Who are the teachers? What are they teaching? Why don't we get all these details? Why am I not get, getting all these details from southern Afghanistan? They said schools are opened in Zabul. I don't see a single report that confirms that and also at the same time verifies that this will prolong go on. At the same time, how many Shia and Hazara families have been displaced from central Afghanistan because of Taliban yes. and no a news report have ever talked about it. So on one side, when uh, um, UN representatives embrace them, at the same time, they're making them feel comfortable in those rooms where they don't take all these Afghan women to talk to the Taliban. I know about my country more than a UN representative would ever know, but they won't let us do the talking. A UN representative will do the talking. What does she know about my country? That's one thing that always makes me question the whole uh, crisis and so her hopes. 
So on that note, in terms of knowing about your country, what can you tell us about this increasing threat of a widespread famine and economic collapse right now? The UN has said these crises are preventable because the main causes are sanctions. Uh, you have thousands of refugees going to Pakistan and Iran. Iran is also under sanctions. What would you say to Joe Biden if you got a conversation with the US president? What would you ask him to do right now? First and foremost, pressurize the Taliban into accepting Afghanistan and Afghans and our identity. We are a different country than we were back in the 90s that they ruled. Joe Biden has the right to do that, and Joe Biden has the power to do it. America held its ground. America legitimized the Doha deal. They can still do it when it comes to Taliban. They still The Taliban want money to fu function as a group, as a political group yes. in Afghanistan. One of the examples, let me give it to you. The Taliban are so incapable right now that a regional hospital in southern Afghanistan is taking babies from all the six re uh, provinces. And in each bed, you will find three babies right now. And we are the ones who are helping them. And I'm a small organization. And this is not something that I want to do that, OK, I did it. No, it's just the fact that we understand Afghanistan much more better than the Taliban do. They don't understand starving and malnourished are two different things. That mothers, if they are starving, the children will starve automatically. We need to take yes. responsibility for our own country, but also people in power need to make sure that we are the ones doing the talking. Yes, indeed. Well said. Pashtana Durrani, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight, and please do stay safe. Appreciate you taking time out and coming on the show tonight. Thank you. Before we go tonight, there are many amazing things I am still learning about my adopted homeland, including this morning when my team told me this was their first education on the ins and outs of the legislative process. I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill, and I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. It's catchy. It's wildly relevant today. Bill back better. And I guess that's why that cartoon and song is an American institution. And it's all because of this man, songwriter and jazz pianist Dave Frischberg. You've probably never heard his name, but Frischberg played with all kinds of legendary singers, including Judy Garland, who wanted him to be her musical director. He declined, by the way. Half a century of American school kids benefited from that decision because, yes, Frischberg was the writer behind I'm Just a Bill and other classic episodes of Schoolhouse Rock. Dave Frischberg died yesterday at age 88 in Oregon. I know my team and the show wouldn't be the same had it not been for his music. One last thing before I go tonight. If you love watching the Mehdi Hassan show, and I'm sure you do on Peacock, I'm sure you set your clocks to it, then you should know that, yes, my name's on the show, but there is a group of immensely talented, hardworking people behind the scenes, off camera, producing it all. And the leader of them, the boss of them, the executive producer, is a tall, bearded, politics-obsessed, Atlanta Braves-obsessed Georgian named Benjamin Mayer. And sadly, he is leaving us for night NBC Nightly News. So I have to say to him, I have to say to Ben, thank you very much. Over the past year, you and I and this team have built this show from the ground up, and I literally could not have done it without you, my friend. So good luck. And Lester Holt, who you are outrageously ditching me for, is a very lucky man. On that note, good night for real. That does it for the Mehdi Hassan Show this week. Alicia Menendez is in the chair tomorrow night here on Peacock. And you can join us anytime on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. You know the deal. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories.
Thank you for watching.